Hello and welcome to A Fountain of Useless Information, a micro-podcast hosted by Ann O'Connor. Each 15-minute episode will feature a person, much like yourself, who knows something unusual, interesting, and maybe even zany that is near and dear to their heart. On this episode of A Fountain of Useless Information, we have Pete Capadagli. Pete Capadagli is going to talk all about the Ivor Johnson bicycles, which were popular at the beginning of the 20th century. Thanks for coming today, Pete. You're going to tell us all about Fitchburg's famous bicycle manufacturer, Ivor Johnson. Pleasure to be here, Ann. I appreciate it. So let's start with maybe a brief history of how this factory came to Fitchburg and how it expanded. Well, it all started in Worcester. When Ivor Johnson came to the United States uh, from Norway, uh, he got a job as a gunsmith at a, at a Worcester shop. It was right about the Civil War, so uh, firearms were in demand. Uh, he was in Worcester for many years, manufacturing firearms, and then evolved into bicycles. And at some point in time, there was a big businessman in uh, Fitchburg, J.P. Dillon of Dillon Boiler Works, and he convinced uh, his friend, Ivor Johnson, to relocate his entire production to Fitchburg. And he even found him a great manufacturing facility on River Street that was just being abandoned by the uh, Henry Haywood Furniture Company. Which moved to neighboring Gardner at the time. Correct, yeah. yeah. So they came here. He employed, I imagine, many Scandinavians and Norwegians. Yeah, most of them had a last name of Johnson. <laughs> okay, or at least some kind of son. <laughs> yes, that, that was important. <laughs> Very important. Yeah. So one of the, let's concentrate on bikes today because that's your specialty. What types of bikes did he make? Well, Ivor Johnson pretty much made every type of bicycle that you could imagine, uh, starting from children's bikes. He made the uh, tricycles or velocipedes. Uh, he made sidewalk bikes. What it, are those, Pete? S- sidewalk bikes? Sidewalk bikes are simply a two-wheeler that's very small and built to, to be the frame size for a small child. And so they graduated from the tricycles of velocipedes to the sidewalk bikes, uh, and they, uh, those were very nice. And then, of course, they even made smaller frame, full-size bicycles when they got just a little bit older. But their, but their, their key was uh, the bicycle line from... Uh, the very simple children's bikes, all the way up to the very, very uh, expensive and well-built racing bikes, which were the the top-of-the-line product. And there were some very excellent athletes who rode Ivor Johnson. Oh, absolutely. At the turn of the century, we're talking uh, 1899-1900, Ivor Johnson sponsored probably the best racing athlete of the day, Major Taylor, and he rode exclusively Ivor Johnson bicycles. Uh, and another gentleman by the name of Harry Elks uh, who raced Ivor Johnson bicycles. And uh, Major Taylor won national awards. Which was really amazing for the time because he was a black man. Yes, yes. And, and that's, there's an, kind of an interesting story behind that. The, the National Bicycle Association at that time, uh, they did not like uh, black athletes competing with their white counterparts. And they trumped up some charges against Major Taylor and fined him $500. At that time, they might as well have fined him a million dollars because that was a lot of money back then. He just couldn't pay it. So he was basically going to drop out of uh, racing. Ivor Johnson came along, not only paid the fine, but sponsored him and had him ride the bicycles. So he became very successful, won a lot of major races, and that, a lot of that's contributed to the Ivor Johnson company. That's really incredible. And we have to keep in mind that at that point, cycling was bigger than baseball. Oh, cycling was huge. At the turn of the century, there were thousands of bicycle manufacturers throughout the nation. Uh, Many of them survived, but a great majority of them never survived. So we had a lot throughout the nation. Um, Where did Ivor Johnson sell their goods? How did they do this? Well, Ivor Johnson was very, very big and successful in advertising, and they had a dealership network that went throughout the entire United States, and they had warehouses pretty much located in key cities in the country. Uh, Even from the United States, they expanded, and they went worldwide, and they had a presence in in Europe, uh, 
in Australia, uh, the Philippines, South America. And it's not uncommon today if you see some of their bicycles for sale, like on some of the big uh, sites like eBay, let's say, you know, you'll see a location. This bicycle is located in South America or the Philippines because that's where they were shipping their bicycles at that time. It, it just, I, it, it's a mind-boggling experience when you think at that point in time, uh, so early, that they had this exposure everywhere in the world. It truly is, but it was an international company. You told me that they used um, seamless steel at one point, and that's not an American product, or was not then. No, one of Ivor Johnson's claim to fame was they made an extremely high-quality bicycle, and when other manufacturers were using a seamed steel, just welded steel pipe, Ivor Johnson was using seamless steel imported from, from England, uh, when other companies were using stamped metal parts for their bicycle frames, Ivor Johnson was using drop forged pieces, which again was very, very tough. So they, they had a plus a lot of their parts, their key, key parts to the bicycle, uh, like handlebar stems, seat posts, frame arches, uh, pedals, uh, pedal supports. They were all made in house. And they were, they were stamped on forges, so they were extremely strong. So they, they were known throughout the, uh, uh, the bicycle world as being one of the highest quality bikes ever manufactured. And um, many of them still survive today. Oh, yeah. They, they still survived, even, even though, Ann, uh, they didn't really, by uh, other manufacturers' amounts, make a lot. Their total... Uh, that they made from start to finish, 1891 to 1941, was about 650,000 units. And when you consider that other manufacturers were, were manufacturing bikes in the millions, that's not a lot. But Ivor Johnson bicycles uh, were kind of treasured, and they were they were built to last. And if you owned one, you had to you had to go out and spend a little more money for an Ivor Johnson bicycle because they, they demanded a little more money. So for that for that product that you spent a little more money of, you were a little bit hesitant to throw it away or bring it to the dump. You hung it in your barn. <laughs> <laughs> Until Pete comes right, along and I'm, finds it. <laughs> I'm not going to get rid of this thing because I paid a lot of money for it. So it survived. And, and a lot of them have been noticed and, and discovered today. Awesome. Um, you also mentioned that uh, two more things I'd like to cover, that they became the largest supplier of branded sporting goods. Yes. The, the, the Ivor Johnson Arms and Cycle Works were just that. They manufactured uh, firearms and bicycles. That's pretty much all they manufactured, other than for maybe three brief years, motorcycles, which are highly collectible today. But in about 1900, there was a large manufacturer of sporting goods in Boston called the J.P. Lovell Arms and Sporting Goods. And Ivor Johnson, the company, had a little disagreement with him. Uh, when they moved to Fitchburg, uh, they had previously been manufacturing bicycles for J.P. Lovell, and it, they decided they were not going to do that any longer. They were going to brand their bicycles Ivor Johnson. So J.P. Lovell had to scramble for places to build his bicycles and didn't do it very successfully. But the bottom line is, uh, eventually J.P. Lovell decided to sell the entire business. Ivor Johnson bought the business. And he had a good network of sporting goods. So Ivor Johnson would take over that sporting goods part of the business and get in touch with other sporting good manufacturers and brand their product Ivor Johnson. So at one point in time, Ivor Johnson became the largest supplier of sporting goods in the entire world. And they held that position for many years. Well, they had Ivor Johnson stores in some of the major oh, cities. Absolutely. They had stores everywhere throughout the country and the world. Even in Fitchburg, uh, they had a large uh, sporting goods store on the corner of Maine and Putnam. Too bad they weren't selling seconds, huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing you mentioned were some of the innovations that they made in bicycle manufacturing. Can you touch on a couple of those? Yeah. Uh, one of the largest innovations that they made over the years was their introduction in 1901 of a special frame called the truss frame. 
Uh, prior to that time, when there were thousands and thousands of bicycle manufacturers, everybody was making a diamond frame. What do you mean by a diamond frame? Well, it's a frame that's shaped like a, like a diamond, like a triangle. And if you saw 100 bikes coming down the street, they were like cars today. You couldn't tell the manufacturer. They all look the same. Uh, in 1901, Ivor Johnson's son, Frederick, applied for a patent for a truss frame, which was simply an arched bar below the top frame of the bicycle. So you had your basic diamond or triangle shape with an arch. With an arch in the middle of the frame. Okay. And that became a trademark of Ivor Johnson in 1901. They applied for a patent. When they got that patent, they were smart business people, and they uh, just advertised that patent relentlessly everywhere, and they called it Trust the Truss. Whether you were a bicycle racer back then, or you were a kid in the street that wanted to pretend you were a racer, or you just wanted to be cool, you had to have a truss frame bicycle because they just look good, and they separated them from all the other manufacturers. Uh, so that uh, not only increased business but built the company tremendously with that innovation. Wow. Did they do different colors on their bikes? They, they were like the model, model T Ford. They were available mainly in black <laughs> okay. back then. But they did branch out, and they did make a lot of, of reds uh, and sometimes blue. But to get a bicycle from Iva Johnson today with a, a, a color – other than black is is rare, and but they did in certain years offer options like a robin's egg blue, and uh, green, and those those are very difficult to find today. Okay, so all that painting was done right in the same factory complex. Everything was done right on River Street in Fitchburg, whether it was painting, uh, pinstriping, uh, uh, chrome plating, nickel plating, all done right in Fitchburg right on River Street. Wow. Now, do you have any resources that people could look at to um, see some Ivor Johnson bikes? Well, the best place to see the Ivor Johnson bikes today, if you want to see a good variety of, si of the uh, cycles, uh, is to go to my website, which is theboulderartgallery.com. Go to the tab on the top that says Favorite Links. And you can see the Ivor Johnson bicycle collection that I have. And pretty much on uh, following that link will lead you to a lot of different uh, styles of Ivor Johnson bicycles. Uh, one of the things that I kind of pride myself on in that collection is for three years, 1896, 97, and 98, when Ivor Johnson first came to Fitchburg, <clears throat> they not only badged their bicycles Ivor Johnson, but they badged a second line, Fitchburg. And other than the badge, they were identical? Almost identical. Uh, they, they claimed that the Fitchburg bicycle would sell for a little bit less money than the Ivor Johnson bicycle. But because they made so few of the Fitchburg badged bicycles, they are extremely rare today. And to find one of those is really special. And have you? Oh, yes. I, I, I found an 1896 Fitchburg, 7 and 8, and you can see those in the, uh, in the collection that I have. Oh, great. People will be very happy to see those, yeah, I those think. Yeah, are, those are kind of special, and I plan on keeping those forever. Good for you. <laughs> well, thank you, Pete. It's my pleasure, Ann. Appreciate always, you coming I, out. Always willing to talk about Ivor Johnson and, the, and their bicycles. All right. To see Pete's collection of bicycles... Go to theboulderartgallery.com, click on Favorite Links, and then go to Ivor Johnson Bicycle Collection. A Fountain of Useless Information is hosted, produced, and edited by Ann O'Connor. Do you have an idea for the podcast? You can reach Ann through her website, anneoc.com, A-N-N-E-O-C.com, on Facebook at Our History AOC or by calling or texting 978 958 0054.
All music on the podcast is in the public domain or is written and performed by the host and guests of the podcast. A Fountain of Useless Information was recorded at the Fitchburg Access Television Studios in Fitchburg. They are on the web at fatv.org.